In this video we will discuss identification and authentication as it relates to system security. The process of identifying and authenticating the user are essentially two separate processes. Identification is the process by which a system recognizes the validity of a user's identity, that is, verifying whether a user is authorized or not. And this is done by several means, and typically this is done via user names. By far the most prominent way, map the user names to a user ID, which is typically a numeric value. For example, Unix system uses a multi-character number to identify a user, whereas Windows will use the UID or the SID to identify a user. Authentication, on the other hand, is the process by which a system verifies a user's claimed identity. That is, they're checking to make sure that the user claims who they say they are. And there are three ways that you can verify a user's identity. The first is, is by something that the user knows. For example, a password or PIN number. The second is, is it something that the user has? For example, a smart card or an RSA token. That is something that's physical that the user can hold. And finally, there's something that the user is or has from a biometric standpoint, such as biometric identification, a fingerprint, a face scan, an iris scan, a retinal scan, you can strengthen the identification and authentication process by using multiple methods. For example, two-factor authentication, such as having a smart card and then requiring a PIN number. By including a smart card and a PIN number, you're increasing the chances that the user is who they say they are. Notice that no authentication process is 100% foolproof. First, we'll talk about the most commonly used form of authentication, and that is passwords. Passwords have to be stored on the computer somewhere or on a network computer. However, if passwords are stored as plain text, that is as readable text as you see on the screen, they may be subject to compromise. So the usual solution is to hide them using a one-way function which is easy to compute but difficult to invert, and this is called a hash function. And so what occurs is that instead of storing the password as plain text, we take the text of the password, we hash it, and we match it against the information that's contained in a file on the system to determine whether the two hashes match. If the two hashes match, then the user has been authenticated. So take a look at, let's take a look at what this would look like in Linux. We'll open a terminal, and we will change our directory to the Etsy directory which holds configuration files and let's look at two files that are used in authenticating users. The first is something called the password file, the PASSWD file. Note that this file contains information on users. Some of these are actual physical users, such as root, and others are system services. Notice that in the left-hand corner are the usernames. Then we have a column that have X's in it, and this is where a password would be placed. And instead of keeping the password file has to be readable by all users because it's a way that the user can change the information, if we scroll down to the bottom, is that we have another actual real user here, PC, that's me. Notice that it's got my full name here, it's got my path, and the shell that I use. And so this has to be readable by all users so they have the capability of changing the information in here. Notice that there are two numbers in here that are mapped to my username PC. The first is my user ID 1000 and the second is a group ID 1000. If we go back to the top of the screen we see that root has a user ID of 0 and a group ID of 0. So anytime somebody is also in a group 0 they have the capability of running as root.
But as you'll notice, there's no password in here. So let's get out and look at the second file that's used for password authentication, and that's called the shadow file. The shadow file is only readable by root or services that are running as root. Notice that there's an exclamation point in here. That indicates that root is not allowed to log in, or rather that a user running as root is not allowed to log in. And the reason for this is that Ubuntu sees this as a security measure and requires you to use the sudo command to initiate root commands as opposed to being able to log in and run as root throughout the whole session. If we go down to the bottom, instead of the star that we saw in the password file, is that we have a hash. And a hash is a, the result of applying a mathematical algorithm against a, a series of characters. And the reason we have a hash instead of the plain text password is because if someone was able to get in here and saw the plain text password, they would be able to log in as me. However, with a hash, it's impossible to take a hash of a password and to be able to guess the password that maps to this hash. So to reiterate, passwords are not used to authenticate users and they are not stored in plain text form anywhere on the computer. Passwords, rather, are run through a hashing algorithm which makes them a meaningless series of characters as you saw previously. So how does this work? This is a graphical illustration of how passwords work. As you see here, this is actually a graphical representation of how the password authentication process works on an old Unix system. When you create your password, there's a random series of characters, typically 12 bits, that's generated by the system. If you have a seven character password, that's going to be 56 bits. And what happens is, is this salt that's generated by the system, remember a randomized series of characters, is added to the 56 bits here, and then it's encrypted, and then it's loaded in what used to be the password file, but what is now called the shadow file. So it wouldn't hold the password file or shadow file now holds your user ID, the salt, and the password. So why do we need the salt? The reason we need the salt is that two passwords will always hash to the same output. And therefore, if root were able to look into the shadow file and notice that two hashes were exactly the same, then they would know those two passwords were exactly the same. However, with assault, that guarantees that all hashes for all users will always be different. And so during the authentication process, let's say you're trying to log into your Linux system, you type in your password, the system goes out and it extracts the salt, it adds it to the password, and, and then it hashes it, and then it compares it to the encrypted password here, which includes the salt and the hash. If those match, you've been authenticated. To reiterate, the user types in a password, for example, ABC123, a 12-bit salt is added to this six character password. Again, the reason we add the salt, if, that, if, if different users having the same password, the hash would match, giving the attacker the clue about the password were they able to access the shadow file. And then the hash is calculated, and then the system compares the hash value, which includes the salt and the password, to the information in the password file. If it matches, again, the user is authenticated. The critical characteristics of a hashing algorithm are that someone cannot move backwards from the hash to the password. That is, given, essentially, hashes are one-way functions. That is, every time you put in ABC123 and apply the hash function, it will always result in the same hash. However, Knowing the hash does not provide us any information about the password that was used.
So what makes passwords vulnerable? Well, with respect to the Unix password file, we can be broken in two simple steps. The first is, is to obtain a copy of the password file, PASSWD, and run a dictionary attack against the file. But this only works on the old Unix systems because the passwords were kept in the Etsy password file. The problem was is that Etsy password is world readable. It allows users to change their preferences as I demonstrated earlier. So the users can see other users hash passwords. And if you're able to get a copy of the password file, you can then work on those hashes to determine if you can break a password. That is, if you can guess it. And we will demonstrate this a little later. In order to understand password vulnerability, you need to understand a little about the password space. The password space is a set of all passwords. The size of a password space is determined by the length of the password, denoted by L, and the size of the password alphabet, denoted by A. So the size of the password space is A to the Lth power. So let's see why simple passwords could be easy to break. So the length of the passwords are denoted by L, and the size of the password alphabet, again, de denoted by A. So let's say that we had four characters are required for a password and no more than four, and we're only allowed to use the characters small, case, A, B, C, D, through Z. So the size of the password space would be 26 to the fourth power. So let's change this to a scientific calculator. And so 26 to the fourth power is 456,976. Now for a human being, it would be impossible to go through all the different combinations of passwords. However, most of the time that a password is broken, it's done with a computer. And actually, on a fast computer, you could run through all combinations of this password in just a second or two. Now let's say that instead of requiring four characters that we require a minimum of eight characters. And for the size of the alphabet we're going to include upper and lower case letters, we're going to include numbers, and we're going to include spare special characters. And so there's 26 times two upper and lower case letters and there are 10 numbers, 0 through 9. And there are 32 special characters. So we have a possible 94 different characters to be used in your password. So if we take 94 and raise that to the 8th power, we get a very, very large number. Now even a computer, even the fastest computer, will take several days to run through this password space, but it can still be done. What this suggests is, is that our password policies should require a minimum of a certain number of characters, typically eight, and they want that our users to use combinations of uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. Windows uses two different types of passwords for authentication, something called the Landman and the NT passwords. Under Windows, hashes for passwords are stored in the SAM file, or the Security Access Manager file. And until recently, two separate hashes were stored, something called, as I indicated, the Land Manager file, which is required by Win3 clients, the Mac and OS2 clients, so they can talk to each other, and then the NT hash, which is used by NT workstations only. Now, the Landman hashes supported 14 characters or less. That is, any password that was less than 14 characters were padded with zeros. So if you were to input the password yada, then the resulting Landman password would be yada followed by 10 zeros. Then, the password was then converted 
to uppercase and then it was to split into two parts. So you had capital yada, zero, zero, notice seven characters, and then the remaining zero characters. And then the two parts are separately hashed and then compared against the, uh, the hash in the SAM file. What is the problem with this? Well first, since the two parts are hashed separately, if the password is less than seven characters, which most are, then the last half is always the same. That is, the resulting hash of zero, zero will always be the same if you have less than seven characters. So the cracker, the person who was trying to determine what the password was, only had to crack 26 to the seventh power. Moreover, since LANWAN passwords are forced into uppercase, this reduces the key space by one half. Obviously, if no alpha characters are not required. The WinNT password works a little differently and is much stronger than the LANMAN password. NT passwords are first converted to Unicode and then a hash, the MD4, is used to acquire a 16-bit one-way hash. And so let's look at the password space depending upon the number of characters that are required and whether you use upper and lower case and digits. So L is the length of our password. If we talk about lowercase letters, then 26 to the L is our password space. By using upper and lower case, it's 52 to the L. Uppercase and lowercase and digits, 62 to the L. And that does not include special characters. Notice as we move to creating a greater number of required characters, that the password space increases dramatically. Also, by requiring lower and uppercase letters and digits, the password space also increases dramatically. If we want to exhaustively try all passwords, for example, with a computer, on average you'll need about n, which would be this number in the cells, divided by two passwords. If you had one try each second, 60 tries a minute, it would take 86,400 tries a day to guess these passwords. If passwords are of length 6 and consist of lowercase letters, it will take 60 months on average. There's an issue with using words that are in the dictionary. For example, if an English word is used as a password, the problem is greatly simplified because there are only 5,000 eight-letter English words. And the intruder using a computer can guess one of these in 42 minutes on average. And that's probably running on a PC. For larger computers, it may take only several seconds. So if an intruder was able to steal an encrypted password file and used encryption software against it, it might take 10 to the minus 6 seconds to check whether an encrypted string is one of the encrypted passwords. So a six-letter password can be guessed in 55 seconds, 155 seconds on average. And we'll demonstrate this a little later. If someone were to use a small PC to do an exhaustive search for a hash of a password, we can see that depending upon the number of characters in the password and what is used as the space of characters, they could take anywhere from 30 milliseconds to 318 hours to break a password. So what does this in terms what does this mean in terms of security issues for the administrator. Well, there are two conditions that exist that make password protection even more difficult now. The first is encryption algorithms now come in faster versions and we have faster PCs reducing the time for an attack. In fact, we have something called distributed attacks where we use multiple computers that are hooked together over a network and then each computer is doled out a part of the key space, making the attack much, much faster. And probably the biggest problem is that users rarely understand the need for good passwords because most users say, well, I have nothing to protect. But what they don't realize is an attack on the whole system could come through their account. That is, once they break into their account, they may have access to other information on the system which might provide the intruder with the capability of breaking into even more important systems and more important accounts. And that's why one of the first principles of security is that users must be educated in security needs. They must become aware of the importance of security and good password usage.
and here's here's an example of poor password uses usage here's an example of poor password usage a few years ago somebody did a study of 3289 passwords on one unix system and, and they discovered this distribution of passwords as you can see 15 accounts had a single ascii character 464 had three ascii characters 605 had six letters all lowercase and 492 of the remainder appeared in reasonable guest lists what this suggests is is that even when users are told of the importance of passwords they still don't use them why is that because good passwords are hard to remember here's another study on a test of over 13,000 accounts 24 percent of which were broken by an automated password cracker and you can see right here the size of the dictionary that was used in the dictionary attack and essentially what this is is that you take a dictionary of for, or for example numbers of Chinese characters of place names and then you hash those and then you compare that against the hash of the hashes in the password file or the SAM file and as you can see 24 percent of those passwords were broken just by using these dictionaries so how does an intruder get a password well as it turns out people like to use for example names of relatives friends sports stars and their pets as passwords and so it, an intruder could try to social engineer the names of relatives friends and and so on or things of interest to the uh, the user and try to use those as passwords another common problem is that passwords are written down and posted near the computer and that's because for several reasons one of which is as I indicated previously that good passwords are hard to remember and also password policies often require users to change passwords on such a frequent basis that it's hard to remember what password they're currently using and of course finally there's password cracking software that's freely available on the internet and usually they provide at least two different types of attacks the first is a dictionary attack as I mentioned previously and again that's when you take and you use that software to hash all the words in a dictionary you take a dictionary and you has hash all the entries and then you compare those hashed entries against the hashes in the password shadow or the sand file if it matches then that's the password if that doesn't work there's something called a brute force attack and what that means is that the password cracker tries every conceivable combination of letters uppercase lowercase special characters and numbers hashes those and then compares those against the shadow file entries or the SAM file entries and here's an in illustration of a dictionary attack the first thing we need to do is to get the master password list which would include the user's name or user ID and then the hash password and this is an example right here from a Linux system on two accounts both mine you notice they have my username and the hash once you have the master password list you get a list of popular passwords and then you hash all of those passwords from the popular password lists and then you compare the hash passwords from step number three against those from the master password list so you see here we've got a list of commonly used passwords you hash those and then you can compare these hashes to those in the master password list if it matches for P. Craiger that's my password and here's an illustration where I'm running a password cracker against a shadow file if we notice down here that the password for Philip Craiger was guessed genie and that cracked in about 15 seconds here's an example of a password cracker 
that was being used against a uh, SAM file, a landman passwords for the uh, for Windows. This is a program called Loftcrack, which uh, no longer exists, but it was created by Loft Heavy Industries, which is a group of hackers in the good sense, a few years ago. So we've got a password file here and a word list that is a dictionary that's being used to, to crack this password. Notice on the left here we have our usernames and we have the landman passwords and the NT passwords. And we see here we have the landman hash for these passwords and the NT hash. Notice that the NT passwords are in, all in lowercase and as we talked about before the landman password is just the NT password in uppercase and then adding zeros. Notice if you look at the landman hash all these numbers in here at the end are the same. AAD3B435B51404EE and that's because all of these passwords were less than seven characters so this is just the hash of seven zeros. And so if you see this you know that the person's password only contained seven or less characters. And so you no longer have to hash you know you no longer have to hash this because you know it's zero. Now you, the cracker can concentrate on the first seven characters. In contrast, a brute force attack takes every combination of uppercase, lowercase, number, and special character and creates combination and permutations out of them, hashes them, and then compares the result of the hash to the hash of the user's password. And we start at A, AA, and so on until we get every conceivable permutation and combination. Which will take longer, a brute force attack or a dictionary attack? A dictionary attack is limited by the size of the dictionary, whereas a brute force attack can take days, years, and maybe even centuries to carry out, depending upon the length of the password. Once again, here, using loft crack, we see that we have our passwords here. Notice that all I'm doing here is increasing the character count in here. So let's look at an example of an attack for Windows. So here I've used pwdump, which is a free program, which is used to read the SAM file and to extract the landman hash and the NT hash. Notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different users on here one of which is an SSH service which has no password and one of which is guest which has no password that is it's inactive the rest have both a landman hash and an NT hash and then I used a program called John the Ripper which is a password cracker to try to guess these password hashes so I loaded John and I'm using incremental search here with passwords which is the file that contained the the hashes notice it loaded six passwords with no different salts notice that it indicates that it understands that this is an NT and landmass landman password file John starts working on the file notice that it guessed that for D Hinton that the last the second part of the landman hash was a one Notice that for PC, it almost immediately guessed my password, which was ABC123. And the account ABCDE was guessed as ABCDE as the password. And a lot of times you'll see that users use their username as their password. You see next that John guessed that D Hinton account, the first part of the landman hash was D Hinton. 
So now we know that D Hinton's password is D Hinton and one. This is the second part of the landman hash, and this is the first part of the landman hash. Now the cracker has access to D Hinton's account. So D Hinton's account was broken in about five minutes. I continued running this overnight. And you see that John ended up being able to guess that B. Weesey's password was 1 B. Weesey. So that ends our introduction to identification and authentication. In the next videos, we will look at the use of password crackers as a means of allowing a system administrator to audit the password goodness of their users. And we'll talk about other modes of identification and authentication.